Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records. And this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and on TikTok. So this band's introduction to the Vinyl Monday verse wasn't exactly a smooth one. <laughs> Back in July, this band's biggest record earned the esteemed honor of making the inaugural episode of I Don't Like. But their history is so long and with so many twists and turns that it would be ludicrous not to at least revisit this period. This week's album, the one that started it all, kind of, is... <laughs> Fleetwood Mac self-titled, AKA The White Album. Hey, you guys have been requesting The White Album up the wazoo, but you didn't specify which one. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you wanna play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls. Sometimes you can pick what albums you wanna see on the series. You can find all of that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is an original, or at the very least, an early repress from 1975. I don't know if it's just me, but this cover art looks a lot like you don't mess around with Jim. I guess I didn't have it, I'll just put a photo here. But for real, these photos have such a similar composition with the arch and the door frame that I looked up if Herbie Worthington shot Jim Croce too. He didn't, that was Paul Wilson. Under this door frame, we have both the band's namesakes, Mick Fleetwood on on the left and John McVie on the right. This is the only studio album cover John ever posed for and he picked a weird one, didn't he? If you look at this photo for too long, it gets a little freaky. You have Mick in the suit with tails, an old fashioned cane, and sipping on a glass of champagne like the debonair English gentleman he most certainly wasn't. Then you have John. This isn't some perspective weirdness like our album cover last week. Uh, John's on his knees with his shoes in front of him so he looks tiny. He's tossing a crystal ball in the air. This is the first time one of those has appeared on a Fleetwood Mac album cover and far from the last time, but just take a closer look at it. The reflection doesn't match. There's a vision inside the crystal ball. These guys were no strangers to surreal album covers, but this one takes the cake. I have no idea what any of this is supposed to mean. My copy came with a lyric sheet, B-roll Abby will be happy to show you that, and on the back cover, we have a photo of our current lineup of Fleetwood Mac. We have our returning players, Mick Fleetwood on drums and percussion, John McVie on bass, and wifey Christine McVie on keys, synths, and lead vocals on Warm Ways, Over My Head, Say You Love Me, and Sugar Daddy. She takes co-lead on World Turning too, And a couple new players, which we will meet very soon. We have just one special guest on this album, Waddy Wackdell on guitar, for Sugar Daddy. Self-titled was produced by Fleetwood Mac with Keith Olsen. Roll transition. <laughs> So it's 1974, the ever-evolving Fleetwood Mac's latest record, Heroes Are Hard to Find, has flopped, and leader Bob Welch has left the band. Back when I researched the Rumors video, I saw a quote from a 2003 feature in Uncut Magazine saying that Bob Welch's departure ended Fleetwood Mac's ninth lineup in eight years. Put a big fat asterisk next to this because this counts every personnel switch up, which I don't do. I break up Fleetwood Mac's history into eras, starting with Peter Green, then Danny Kerwin, 
than Bob Welch. While it's certainly less of a statement to balk at than nine lineups in eight years, the end of the third era of Fleetwood Mac was no less of an upheaval. Morale was low, it had been years since the commercial success of Oh Well. Side note, the Bob Welch era is terribly underrated. Of course we have future games, but I am partial to mystery to me, Emerald Eyes in particular. Anyway, to figure their sh** out, Fleetwood Mac moves from England to sunny Los Angeles. Mick F. drops into Sound City Studio to meet up with engineer Keith Olsen. Mick mentions he's out yet another guitarist and is looking for a replacement. So Keith plays him this record he worked on last year, Buckingham Nix, was a folk duo based out of San Francisco consisting of scrappy guitarist Lindsey Buckingham and his girlfriend, singer and songwriting partner Stevie Nix. They put out one self-titled album on Polydor. I do not have it but really wish I did because A, some of those songs are quite lovely and B, would become Fleetwood Mac tunes like Crystal. It's been blocked from reissue for the past 50 plus years because Stevie regrets being naked on an album cover with someone she's not dating anymore. I don't want to see any complaining in the comments. Stevie is allowed to regret being naked on an album cover. Mick was blown away by what he heard on Buckingham Nick, specifically Lindsay on Frozen Love, which Duh, it's the best Buckingham Nick song. Mick hired Keith as Fleetwood Mac's new producer on the spot, and on New Year's Eve 1974, he calls up Lindsay asking him to join the band. I imagine when Lindsay got this call from this random British bloke, he had two thoughts. Number one, do I really want to be in Fleetwood Mac? I didn't like the past few records very much. And number two, my dear girlfriend and I are barely making ends meet. She is on the verge of moving back home. I have to look out for us. Buckingham agrees to join Fleetwood Mac, but on one condition. Nix joins too. Mick is like, I don't know, we already have Christine and we don't want to replace her, but Lindsay assures him Stevie isn't a replacement, she's an addition. Thus, the fourth era of Fleetwood Mac is born, the one that will see them through pretty much the rest of their history. Thus, the fourth era of Fleetwood Mac is born. They have no idea at the time, but this lineup will change the course of rock and roll history forever. In early 1975, all of three weeks after first meeting, Fleetwood Mac hunkers down at Sound City to make a record. It takes about three months to make from start to finish. This is a breeze compared to the years-long slog of the next ones. Maybe just as famous as the music from this era are the very complicated, densely interwoven interpersonal relationships between the lineup. At first, Mick considered dropping Buckingham Nicks if Stevie and Christine didn't get along, but this was no issue. They forged an unbreakable bond. They became best friends, seeing each other through all seasons of their lives. Lindsay and Christine find they're a solid songwriting duo. Chris had contributed songs to Fleetwood Mac before, but with Lindsay, collaboration was easy. She was receptive to his suggestions and was a comfortable middle ground between him and Stevie. Sometimes she would play neutral party to their lovers' quarrels. Plus, they sounded great together. To Billboard, Lindsay said, I think we just have this mutual respect as musicians and artists. We're both really grounded in our craft. Pretty ironic considering that meanwhile, Lindsay is butting heads with the OGs. He was used to being the guy in charge, comfortable with making executive decisions, but from time to time, he'd overstep and there'd be a conversation that went a little like this. Is your name Fleetwood? No. Is your name Mac? Not since the last time I checked. Good, then stop acting like it. But his fiery personality and drive really injected some life back into the group. The rest couldn't deny he had the skills to back up his guitarist ego. As for Lindsay and Stevie, 
Their relationship never had a leg to stand on. In hindsight, Stevie saw the bright side of things. Quote, If we had broken up within the first six months of Fleetwood Mac, there would have been no record and we would have been in big trouble. So when we joined the band, we took the decision to hang in there. Buckingham Nicks brought plenty of material to the table, including Monday Morning and I'm So Afraid. The full band re-recorded Crystal, and there was a fourth song. Everybody knows the story of Rhiannon at this point, or a version of it. This is a song about an old Welsh witch. Stevie either wrote the song on a plane or wrote it after reading Triad by Mary Bartlett Leader on a plane. Later on, she discovered Welsh goddess Rhiannon had a similar story to the one she wrote in her song. Some believe it was Rhiannon herself using Stevie as her mortal vessel, not unlike she does in Triad. The Rhiannon character lingered long after this record. Angel off Tusk is about her too, but what we really remember this muse for is how she influenced Stevie's stage presence. Stevie did not always dress like this. In the Buckingham Knicks days, she looked like this, and this, and on the back cover of this record, like this. The Rhiannon persona was slash is defined by lots of black clothing and light swirly fabrics inspired by Stevie's love of ballet. And of course, shawls. So many shawls. Stevie has a literal archive of all of her clothing she's ever worn, and like half of it is just shawls. All songs on self-titled were either written by Lindsay, Stevie, or Christine, except for one. Blue Letter came along pretty late in the process and in quite the serendipitous manner. It was written by Richard and Michael Curtis, the latter of which had a brief stint as instrumentalist for Crazy Horse. They intended to release it themselves and were running it at Sound City when Fleetwood Mac heard it. They loved it so much that they asked if they could record and release theirs first. This and World Turning were the last two songs cut for the album. On May 15th, 1975, Fleetwood Mac reintroduced themselves to the world, kicking off their first tour with Buckingham Nicks in El Paso, Texas, in front of a crowd of 8,000 people. They played new numbers like Rhiannon, Landslide, and I'm So Afraid, Buckingham Nicks solo number, Don't Let Me Down Again, as well as the old stuff. Spare me a little of your Love and Hypnotized from the Bob Welch era, Station Man from the Danny Kerwin era, and the Green Monolishi and Oh Well from the Peter Green era. How would you even do Oh Well with just one guitarist? <laughs> No local papers, let alone music publications, sent their critics out to review the show. But at a homecoming show in 2003, Stevie said it was the most exciting night of her and Lindsay's career. No doubt, this was the start of something new. The track listing of Self Titled goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have Monday Morning. Hey. Followed by Warm Ways, then Blue Letter, next Rhiannon, then Over My Head, and Side 1 closes with Crystal. Opening up Side 2, we have Say You Love Me, then Landslide, next World Turning, then Sugar Daddy, and the album closes with I'm So Afraid. Fleetwood Mac was released in July of 1975 on reprise here in the States. This was interesting to me as I associate Fleetwood Mac with Warner Brothers. Uh, they'd bump over to Warner after this and stay for the next 20 years. Over My Head was put out as a single in September. The band toured aggressively to support this record and a far cry from the glam of limousines and big bad tour buses. They drove from city to city in a van and when stopping at a cheap hotel for the night they'd take turns sleeping in the van so no one would jack their gear in the middle of the night. Rolling Stone took their sweet time getting around to reviewing this one but Scapa published his review in late September. And it's got the most no shit Sherlock opening line I have ever 
ever seen in an album review. And I quote, Not only is Fleetwood Mac no longer blues-oriented, it isn't even really British. For real though, aside from praising Christine's contributions and Lindsay's guitar work, Rolling Stone's review is surprisingly lukewarm. It even calls Stevie out of place. I have to say, Bud uses the past lineups as kind of a crutch in this piece as opposed to necessary context. Rhiannon was cock-blocked from the Billboard Top 10 by the Rolling Stones' as Fool to Cry. Uh, she was re-released in 70 once the stones had fallen off a little bit, uh, but failed to break the top 40 that go around. Though none of the singles would hit number one, the album did eventually. Self-titled was a slow burn. It took over a year to crack the top 10 and hit number one after 15 months, finally dethroning Peter Frampton. By the time it finally snagged the top spot in September of 76, Fleetwood Mac were already knee-deep in making the follow-up. And oh hey, John and Christine are divorcing now. This surely won't have wide-reaching consequences. Oh wait, Lindsay and Stevie are done for good now too? Fine, we'll get some great material out of that. I'm sorry, Mick's wife slept with who now? And he's gonna... Oh, for the love of God! Yeah, the next album is going to be the trauma dump of the fucking century and one of the most successful rock and roll albums ever. Though it's been strongly overshadowed by its coked out younger sister, Self-Titled has a decent chunk of Fleetwood Mac's signature songs, including Landslide. Believe it or not, this song was relatively unknown outside of fan circles until their 1997 reunion gig, That Which Became The Dance. Everyone has covered Landslide. It's become somewhat of an American standard. Tori Amos did it, Bush did it, Harry Styles, The Japanese House, uh, my personal favorite Smashing Pumpkins. Of course, the group formerly known as the Dixie Chicks did it. Open mic singers all across the nation and do this one in troves, even fucking Glee did it. Stevie has made it a staple of her solo sets, um, as of late dedicating it to Christine. This is remembered not so much as a transitional album, but as the kickoff of the most iconic, most consistently commercially successful era of the group. Kind of a miracle considering. Even more remarkable, this was the first Fleetwood Mac lineup to stay together for more than one year. So, what do I think of Self-Titled? <laughs> Ooh. Sincerely hope the nonsense is over with. There is nothing quite like bored old men and they're snowblowers. Going in, I have an interesting relationship with Fleetwood Mac. I appreciate all eras of this mercurial band in one way or another. As a blues girly, I have a deep reverence for its beginnings. Though the Bob Welch records aren't the strongest, I do like some songs, and I do not shut up about the Danny Kerwin era. Purple Dancer and Dragonfly are both top-tier Fleetwood Mac songs change my mind. Buckingham Nick's Fleetwood Mac is a wild card. One big thing before we get into the track by track breakdown. Back in April, I said I didn't truly appreciate Deja Vu by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young until I really poured over CSN. Because that's who I am. I do things backwards. After spending so much time with self-titled, I have slightly warmed up to rumors. Do I love it? Still no, but knowing the foundation it was built off of, uh, it makes more sense. So what did I gather from self-titled to Electric Boogaloo? Firstly, it amazes me how three voices blend the way they do, not just 
vocally, but in their writing styles as well. The way all their writing styles fit so naturally on the same record. Beginning with Mr. Lindsay Buckingham, he kicks off the record with Monday Morning. Of their 10-footed beast, it says a lot that this is the foot Fleetwood Mac decided to put in the door. This song gets stuck in my head like you would not believe. I think I spent all of yesterday just doing things around my house and singing that hook. Lindsay had one hell of a knack for pop songwriting. Then there's his guitar playing. His lead work is of such a degree of intricacy that it's almost impossible to parse out exactly what is what. He's got laser precision that comes with the kind of personality that would restring a guitar every 20 minutes to make sure the tone is just right. Yes, this is a real thing that happened during the Rumors sessions. What sticks out about his songwriting to me is A, the emotional whiplash he loves writing about, and B, the fervor of his delivery. He is just barely on his hinges as he pulls from personal experience, singing about inconsistent, fickle love. He's all in on Monday morning, but contemplates leaving by Friday. She loves him, then goes back on what she says. It erupts into a super smooth cruise control chorus. Basically, if the nervous tick of bouncing your leg was a person, that would be Lindsay Buckingham. Warm Ways is the first of an all-star run by Christine. Seriously, this over My Head and Say You Love Me are all on this record. This one was a single in the UK and I'm surprised it wasn't over here in the States. The prom committees of America would have gobbled this one up. It's the sticky sweetest song here, all 70s soft rock cheese with those harmony vocals. It's guilty pleasure material for sure. Musically, this one feels like a quick callback to the Kerwin and Welch eras before proceeding. You know, washes of cymbals, wafting breezy guitars with plenty of negative space, and a crippling sincerity from Chris. She's transformed a song about the man she's sleeping next to being a fucking furnace. So real, by the way. Men, why do you run so hot at night? I feel like I'm sweating out a fucking fever. Because she turns it into something tender. You may be a nightmare to sleep next to, but I can't wait until the sun rises so I have you again. We take a brief detour with Blue Letter. In an alternate universe, this was issued as a single, went right to number one, and Ricky and Mike had an illustrious songwriting career. This is the other song that gets stuck in my head viciously. Before doing my research, I totally thought this was a Lindsay song. It's got the same feverish drive, the same Graham parsons -y twang. It's even about leaving your lover. The one giveaway is the usage of metaphors laid on thick. Lindsay is pretty objective. Blue letter with silver words and a red bird. That's not him. For every voice you've ever heard, there's a thousand without a word is just too vague to be him. And frankly, too much of a songwriting bullseye to be from him. Where this reads as a Fleetwood Mac composition is in the instrumentation. Oh, f this bass line is good. Just listen to that. That is a 60s Motown bass line crammed into a sunshiny 70s pop rock song and it somehow works? Our introduction to Stevie is Rhiannon. Smoky guitars, bell-like keys, plenty of supernatural imagery. This is the Stevie Nicks thesis statement. She's not just a writer, she's a performer, so all of her stuff is about the atmosphere. And that might have been Buckingham Nick's Fleetwood Mac's golden ticket. Stevie as an image. Finally, a relatively faceless band had a face. That goes a long way for a pop group. Picture Fleetwood Mac in your head, you probably see a five foot tall blonde woman spinning around in black chiffon with a tambourine as she gives her ex-boyfriend a death glare from the corner of her eye. Stevie has an effortless star quality, sure, but her writing is... Ethereal is such an overused word nowadays. We'll dig more into her writing later on. Love it or hate it, Rhiannon is a showcase of Stevie's strong vibrato. Over My Head is one of my favorite Christine tunes, if not my favorite. This song is also about mercurial love, but feels a lot less anxious than the Lindsay stuff. This is Buckingham Nick's Fleetwood Mac at a best that I'm not used to. The composition is relatively understated and very intentional. I'm loving 
Loving the rhythm section here. Mix gentle rolling shuffle is uncomplicated, to the point, best not to take away from Chris's shine. Though Lindsay sings Crystal on Buckingham Nicks and here, Stevie wrote it and has recorded it herself a time or two. It sounds way better when she does it. In the crystalline knowledge of you, drove me through the mountains, through the crystal-like and clear water fountain. Those are Stevie lyrics with a Stevie melody over a Stevie chord progression. The only thing her versions don't have is a Stevie harmony, and that's because she's singing the melody. This is a song of such pure love and adoration. I get a sense of familial love. I have changed, but you remain ageless. This line could go one of two ways, depending on how you interpret it. It's either a parent watching their child grow into adulthood, or kind of like an experience I had recently. My mother has been collecting Barbie ornaments for the past 25 years, as you do when your name is Barbie. And this Christmas, for the first time, she put all of her Barbie ornaments on this little tree. I wish I could describe to you the childlike joy in her eyes in this moment. She could not stop saying how pretty it was and how happy she was. I don't know if it's because my mother loves this period of Fleetwood Mac, but something about Stevie's writing makes me see my mom as all of her past selves at once. Crystal's gotten better each time it's been recorded. The one leg up Fleetwood Max has over Buckingham Nix's is the key change. This one is in E minor. Stevie's voice sounds a lot more comfortable on the harmony. Say You Love Me is a Fleetwood Mac best that I am used to. Chris is three for three so far. The band's synergy is top notch. Lindsay's birdsy jangling solo is great. Cannot believe I forgot to bring that up in my little montage in the Rubber Soul video. Memorable harmony by the time we get to the I want to hit play again. There is nothing I could say about Landslide that hasn't already been said. Well, except this. Stevie captured a uniquely feminine relationship with change on this song. Allow me to explain. Um, in a woman's life, change is loss. Loss of beauty, which our society unfortunately equates to a loss of worth. That's why I'm so obsessively building my body of work here. Um, when I'm no longer beautiful, I need something to still show for myself. Yet at the same time, women must always be changing. Although always digging up new facets of themselves to remain interesting. Changing costumes constantly. You must always be shiny and new, yet at the same time you cannot shed any previously held roles. Take being a mother, for example, one of the many I've seen Landslide applied to. Once those children grow up and go off on their own, what's left of the mother? She has to completely rediscover herself after 20 years of being this one thing. That's terrifying. Landslide is such a beautiful articulation of anxiety and loss of purpose. It's uncanny that Stevie captured that specific experience so succinctly within such open-ended lyrics, seeing as she never had any kids of her own. Maybe it was an accident, Regardless, it's an intuitiveness that very few people possess and even fewer can craft into a songwriting ability. So basically Stevie Nicks is the Bob Dylan of Mothers and Daughters, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. This is where the album takes a pretty sharp downturn in quality. World turning is pretty nondescript, disappointing if you ask me. I wish this Fleetwood Mac allowed themselves to jam more on their records because world turning ends just as it's starting to go somewhere. Sugar Daddy is fine. It's cute, but we literally just did this chipper, keys-driven pop rock thing with Say You Love Me like three songs ago. Why did we pick these two to follow up fucking Landslide? Maybe Self-Titled's biggest flaw is that it doesn't have a closing track. Sure, it has I'm So Afraid, a song that closes the album, but it's no Frozen Love. Imagine if we dropped World Turning and had a re-recorded Frozen Love 
closing this record. The tension, the drama, it could have gone toe to toe with the chain. Looking ahead, I do think Fleetwood Mac fixed this issue with Gold Dust Woman. That is one of the greatest album closers of all time. The more I contemplate this record, the more I realize that without this lineup, Fleetwood Mac wouldn't have survived. They would have been swallowed whole by the mounting legal issues surrounding heroes are hard to find and been donezo. Likewise, the raw, uncut talent of Buckingham Knicks never would have been discovered. These two groups needed each other and joining up was a very vulnerable, brave thing to do. A particularly pessimistic review I read of Future Games described the Buckingham Knicks era as Fleetwood Mac becoming a milk toast pop band. I disagree. I see Fleetwood Mac as incredibly resilient, and this period as the band finally realizing the pop potential they'd been reaching for since pretty much their first album. It all began with this. The fighter getting back up after one hell of a blow. Sure, it'll take another round, but with writers this intriguing and this complementary to each other's skills, a rock-solid rhythm section and the ability to so completely and effortlessly transform within the confines of one album, this multifaceted beast still has a KO left in him. Self-titled is our great reintroduction to Fleetwood Mac. My personal favorites on this one are Monday Morning, Blue Letter, Over My Head, Say You Love Me, and Landslide. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it. That is the end of me wearing lipstick two weeks in a row. When does that ever happen? And that is Fleetwood Mac's White Album. What do you think of this period of Fleetwood Mac? What do you think of the album? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet has to say, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week for... Hey, wait a minute.